What the hell is happening to the honeybees? Humans were first attracted to honeybees for, well, honey, obviously, and beeswax. Honeybees are native to Europe, Asia, and Africa, and the domestication of them started very early, like as early as with the Egyptians. Many years later, domestication centered around increasing honey storage, disease resistance, and ease of pacification by smoke, which of course makes them behave. It wasn't until 1909 in New Jersey where the domesticated bees were used to increase apple pollination. Today, one third of our food relies on honeybees for pollination. Foods like nuts, berries, apples, and many vegetables. In fact, almonds are completely dependent on honeybees for pollination, requiring 60% or 1.4 million of all U.S. honeybee colonies to be shipped in from across the U.S. In total, bees are responsible for 15 billion in U.S. crop production and as high as 200 billion worldwide. That's almost unbelievable. <laughs> Starting in 2006, there was a drastic rise in colony collapse disorder in North America and in European countries. Colony collapse disorder is the abrupt disappearance of the worker bees in the colony. And when the colony is investigated, there are little or no dead bodies in or around the hive. A mysterious abandonment of the hive. Believe it. It's enough bee puns. Yeah, okay. So, how long has it been occurring? Each year since 2007, the USDA has been reporting a loss of one-third of all honeybee hives due to colony collapse disorder. And in 2012 through 2014, there was a loss of about half of all U.S. hives. So, what's causing this? Many studies point to the Varroa Destructor. Well, actually, it's just a mite. This is a mite that only reproduces in bee colonies and attaches itself to the bees and sucks their blood. While doing this, the mites cause and are carriers of several diseases such as the deformed wing virus, where newly formed bees cannot fly due to underdeveloped and deformed wings. Also, the open bite sores on the bees leave them susceptible to other infectious diseases. A large mite infestation will ultimately lead to the death of the colony. Didn't you have a mite infestation? Like, right here? Yeah, didn't yet. I thought you did. Neonicotinoids have been put under heavy scrutiny and hold much of the blame for colony collapse disorder. One study showed that when hives were exposed to sublethal doses of neonicotinoids, it did not increase bee losses, and bees could and did survive. However, when the varroa mite and the neonicotinoids were directly compared in the same study, it happened like this. When colonies were exposed to neonicotinoids and the infections and diseases caused by the mite, it almost guaranteed the colony to collapse, whereas the colonies exposed to only the neonicotinoids still had a good chance of survival. Several studies expanded upon this and showed that the pesticides lower the bee's immune system and makes them more susceptible to diseases. Also, the pesticides seem to alter colony behavior, and other studies showed that the neonicotinoids interfere with the bee's navigation back to the hive causing them to be confused or disoriented. Yet still, other studies have shown that neonicotinoids alone can cause a colony to collapse during overwintering, and that it does not suppress the bee's immune system. So, we may not know exactly how or why yet, but there definitely seems to be a link between neonicotinoids and colony collapse disorder. Are there fixes and cures to the mites? You just shaved everything, right? We can do the same thing to the bees. There is, of course, an arsenal of pesticides or miticides to use against the mites, but mites have been known to grow a resistance against some of them. Honeybees can withstand a wide range of temperatures, whereas the mite cannot. So heaters are placed into the colony, and the colony is heated to a safe temperature for the bees, but a lethal one for the mites. Highly infected areas of the comb can also be frozen, which will effectively kill the mites. And the simple fix to the neonicotinoid is just to ban the pesticide like it has been in Europe. But this has been difficult to do in the U.S. for various reasons that I'm not going to get into. Even with the miticides and the ban of the neonicotinoids in Europe, we are still seeing a large decline in honeybee populations. So, is the farming industry doomed without honeybees? 
Well, no. If only talking about honeybees. Because honeybees aren't even very good at what they do. That is, when compared to wild bee species or native bee pollinators. Native pollinators are said to be two to three times better at pollinating than honeybees are and aren't suffering from colony collapse disorder. A study showed that when pumpkin fields were supplemented with either native bees, honeybees, or no bees, it was found that those supplemented with native bees produced significantly more pumpkins than the fields supplemented with honeybees or no bees. Another study went a little further and showed that honeybees can actually hinder native bees from pollinating crops due to fighting and dominance issues. So, in order to ensure efficient crop production, farmers should consider whether or not they have a sufficient population of native bee species before supplementing their crops with honeybees. But native bees can only be relied upon in places where there is a large variety of plants for the native bees to live around and feed on. Some farms, like many here in the northeast, might be okay. Many farms here are often broken up and surrounded by trees, brush, meadows, forests, rivers, and lakes. These areas provide housing and year-round food for the bees when the crop plants are not in bloom. Other places might not be so fortunate. Remember how I said that almonds are completely dependent upon honeybees being shipped in? This is because almond fields are a massive monoculture with no other plants for sources of food. When almonds are in bloom, thousands of honeybee colonies are shipped in and the bees feed on and pollinate the almond trees. When the blooming is over, the crop fields become void of all food and flowers for the bees. So no bees can survive here and must be shipped back out. This is the case for many farms across the U.S. Vast monocultures fill the landscape that leave no room for other plants and flowers to feed native bees throughout the year. So none can survive in these monocultures. And if honeybees are severely diminished or gone, then there will be absolutely nothing in these areas to pollinate many of our crops. Now we can't fix all this. But it would take some changes. In fact, it would take some drastic changes to revert our modern industrial farming back to how we used to farm. Like back before World War II. What do you... What? That is, we can fix them with polycultures. Polycultures are farms that have many varieties of plants in the same field. All these different plants on the same farm flower at different times of the year and provide a supply of food for the bees all year long. The more variety of plants in an area greatly increases the amount of native pollinators, even if those plants are not crop plants and are just natural vegetation, or what people would call weeds. One study even showed how just a small change in farming can increase native bees. The study showed that in meadows that are typically mowed, if only 10 to 20% of the meadow is left unmowed, it increases the native bee population. This change creates small uncut refuges that can effectively promote native bee pollinators the following year. Undisturbed areas leave undisturbed housing for overwintering. This very reason is why you may sometimes see do not mow signs and ditches along roads by farms. Having a polyculture and leaving native vegetation... Give, give me the chips. No, they're gone. No, they're not. I just watched you open them. No, they're gone. See? <sighs> Having a polyculture and leaving native vegetation could set in motion many benefits for farming. A polyculture farm reduces pests naturally. With a variety of plants and native vegetation, the pest natural predators have many areas to live and overwinter. More natural predators means less pesticides that need to be used, and with a variety of plants blooming all season means no honeybees need to be shipped in. All of this saves the farmer money. But alas, many farmers will not change. Having polycultures means that massive farming equipment cannot be used to harvest the crop all at once. Workers would have to be paid to hand pick or use small machines to harvest. Many farmers may not feel that the money saved on pesticides and shipping in of bees will offset the wages paid to workers. We may not know until extensive studies are done. However, many organic farms operate this way and some are doing quite well. 
Ugh, man, I think the meat in that sub was bad. And finally, can't this colony collapse disorder be eliminated by having bees in greenhouses in a controlled environment? Well, yes and no. Honeybees are like flies and constantly try to fly towards the windows and won't pollinate, so they can't be used indoors. Bumblebees, however, don't care and are effective for pollinating crops in greenhouses. So cool, right? That means if in the future we need honeybees to pollinate our crops in space, we can use bumblebees, right? Yeah! It was found that bees will effectively pollinate at atmospheric pressures as low as 50 kPa, and NASA currently has a recommendation of 52 kPa. Anything below 50 and they won't pollinate or even fly. There's simply not enough air molecules for flight at that low of pressures. Oh man, I got about 50 k pods of air pressure in me right now. And if we are able to colonize a celestial body, the queen bumblebee can be frozen and transported that way. Once at its destination, the queen bumblebee can start a new colony of bees all by herself. That's it. I'm done. Uh, definitely gonna be getting D for D. Uh, D for D? Yeah. Diarrhea for days. <laughs> yeah?